الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أنزل على به الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستوفر ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده له تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهر على دين كل وكفى بالله شهيدا يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما عما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين وبعد Indeed all praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We seek his guidance, we seek his forgiveness We put our faith in him and our reliance upon him And we seek refuge in Allah from the evil consequences of our actions Whom to Allah has guided and there is no one to mislead him And whom to Allah has allowed to go astray and there is no one to guide him 
and we bear witness and we testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and his messenger. Alhamdulillah is to him who has given us the ability in our limbs, the oxygen in our lungs to gather here on the day of gathering, Yom al-Jum'ah so that we can fulfill the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says, فَاسْعَوْ إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Rush and race to the remembrance of your Lord. Rush and race to the remembrance of your Lord so that you can be reinvigorated in your iman as individuals and as a community. I remind myself as I begin this khutbah that every word that I'm saying is being recorded by the angels and I'll be asked about on the Day of Judgment. And likewise, every word that you are listening to is also being recorded by your angels and you too will be asked about on the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His majestic book says, أَمْ كُنْتُمْ شُهَدَاءَ إِذْ حَضَرَ يَعْقُوبَ الْمَوْتُ إِذْ قَالُوا لِبَنِيهِ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِ قَالُوا نَعْبُدُ إِلَهَكَ وَإِلَهَ أَبَائِكَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَائِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ إِلَهًا وَاحِدًا وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ A very valid concern for every practicing Muslim that's living today in 2022 is will my child say La ilaha illallah after I'm gone? Now it's not promised the sequence of who goes first, whether our children will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, God forbid, or we go first. But it's a concern and it's a very dominating top of mind sort of concern for everyone that has a child that's growing up in the schooling system here in the United States or is thinking about having children or is you know now grandparents and now guiding their children with their grandchildren and so you know often we'll find ourselves at family gatherings at barbecues that you might be at this weekend and so on and so forth and people present the three modes of schooling and of course, you know, we have to do everything as believers to position our kids for success in this dunya, but more importantly, the akhirah. But then there are situations, as in the situations of prophets, like Nuh salam. And these are the exceptions, where there's divine guidance and revelation coming, and he's instructed to build the ark, and yet his son goes in the opposite direction. And so he goes astray. And so we see this happening even to the prophets. And what I wanted to present to you today is some research that was done by Yaqeen Institute. And it's also a presentation that was given by Imam Asif Hirani, former uh, Imam of the Masjid and Forge, about when we leave, will my child still be practicing Islam? And this, in fact, the ayah that I recited earlier was the overwhelming concern in this scene where Yaqub alayhi salam, right, his nickname is Israel from Bani Israel because the children that he had would then go on to become the children of Israel where all of the prophets would then come. And on his deathbed, his overwhelming predominant concern is what will you practice and who will you worship after me? And he gets that peace of mind and heart where his children say that we will practice what your religion is. We will worship your Lord and the Lord of your forefathers, Ibrahim, Ismail, and Ishaq. And that we are from the Muslims. We are from those that submit. And so I wanted to present to you this body of work that was conducted under the supervision of Imam Salah ibn Humayd. He is one of the nine Imams of Masjid al-Haram. And there were 31, a consortium of 31 scholars that put together a body of work of 12 books. And they deduced this and filtered this down to five elements, which is not exactly rocket science, right? The idea is that you tie your camel and then you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was observed about the Prophet sallallahu that in his preparation when you observed him, you thought that he didn't rely on Allah. But then when you looked at his reliance on Allah, it looked like as if he wasn't preparing. And so both have to be there. Preparation as well as reliance and tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so without further ado, what were these five elements that these scholars came up with? The first thing, of course, was the family environment. The Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, he said that every man and woman 
is a shepherd and that you are in charge of your flock. That we are held accountable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of how we mold and shape our kids. Dr. Israr Ahmed, right, he says that for a child that's growing up in a Pakistani household, and let's say the mom and the dad, they speak Urdu predominantly. The kid is not going to wake up all of a sudden starting to speak French or Turkish the next day. The input has to be congruent with the output. And similar was found in the research study that was done by Yakin Institute. Now that paper took mostly the, the experiences, religious experiences of Jews and Christians, but it's extrapolated into the Muslim diaspora as well. That the family environment is extremely important. You know, today we have to enlist our kids in programs. It's very difficult. If you go onto the basketball courts, they're, they're mostly empty. Kids don't voluntarily go out and play, ride the bikes around the neighborhood, play on the playground and so on and so forth. You have to enlist kids into programs nowadays, whether it's swimming or fencing or basketball or soccer, whatever it is. And I remember Sheikh Abdullah Uduro was talking about that when you're driving with your child and they're sitting in the car and there's a moment of silence and you're thinking about whatever it is, something that happened at work, something that happened at home, and all of a sudden, your child speaks and he asks a question. That is the moment that you need to pay special attention. Because that is something that's been mulling around in their heads for quite some time. That's something that they've been marinating on for quite some time. And they have this moment with their father, right? Sons have an affinity to their father. Usually daughters have an affinity to their moms. And this is their time that they ask this question. And this is the time that you should pay special attention. Another uh, scholar, Ibrahim Hindi, he says that we, we call this in our family AMA, ask me anything. You want to ask me about girls, you want to ask me about sex, you want to ask me about drugs, you want to ask me anything about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the deen, why do we pray, why is God there, you know, what, why do we do this, why do we do that, why is this halal, why is this haram, right? This is your opportunity to attentively listen. You don't have to react right then and there. This is your opportunity to listen. And you may not have all of the answers. You may need to go back to Sheikh Yasser Fahmi or somebody that is a trusted scholar in your community, a chaplain that's in your community, and ask them, my son, my daughter, ask such and such. Because truth be told, today the tidal wave of what's against you, outside of what our scholars of the past have always told us, nafs, hawa, dunya, and shaitan, now we have perennialism, atheism, LGBTQ movement, which mashallah, this masjid has done a phenomenal job of, you know, countering that narrative. But you have all of these things that are coming at the children and it's right at their fingertips. And we, we have to understand that our kids, you know, starting from five years old and onwards, they have access to this information and they're not dumb. You can start on a Friday and go down the YouTube rabbit hole and by Monday you're an atheist. And so, all of these studies have found that open communication with your kids is of paramount importance. One thing that you can start to institute immediately as a family, if you're not doing it already, is having a set time. Set time for dinner with the family. That you and your wife get on the same page and say that at this time, everything turns off, all the screens go into a basket, and we're forced, almost, to communicate. Right? And, and this is where open communication happens. And it could be mundane conversation. How was your day? You know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And being interested in what your kids are interested in. And so if you have a culture gap with your kids, if you're first generation, you have a particular obstacle that you have to get over, is the language barrier and the culture barrier. Because you just came over to the United States. If they're talking about Fortnite, start to learn the characters that are in Fortnite. If they're talking about some sort of anime, start to learn what that's about and start to communicate with your kids. The Prophet Sallam, he saw that, you know, uh, uh, from Hisham al-Awadi's book, Children Around the Prophet, he makes a mention of this. This kid, his parrot, his sparrow died. A bird died, right? The Prophet Sallam, think about it. He's governing the Muslim Ummah. He has the Jews. He has the Aus and Khazraj that he's you know, trying to reconcile between. He has all of these political issues. He's got his wives. 
he's got his own children, and the parrot of this child dies. And the Prophet ﷺ, he comes into a gathering and this kid is there, and he takes the time to ask him, what happened to your parrot? What happened to, what happened to your bird? Tell me about your bird. He's taking a keen interest in the child. And what did this do? This sort of love, this sort of interest endeared the child's heart towards the parent. So the family environment was the first thing and the most critical foundational block. You built this masjid on a strong foundation so it could hold this dome and the minarets that it supports, right? The foundation starts with the family environment. The second thing that these scholars mention, you know, some of the conversation that you'll have in these barbecues and these gatherings is, well, I send my kid to Islamic school. And that has its pros and that has its cons. And I can speak from all three vantage points because I'm a product of the public school system, Franklin school system, right? Not the greatest, not blue ribbon. My kids have gone to both Islamic schooling as well as homeschooling. So all three modes of schooling are discussed in these gatherings. So then the other brother will come out and say, well, we're paying hefty property taxes and we're in a blue ribbon school system, so I sent my kids there. And then the third will come out and say, well, we're in homeschooling and it's the best of both worlds. And then somebody will attack them and say, you know, with the misnomers, well, you have your kids compartmentalized and aren't they going to be socially inept and all of these things, right? And now that doesn't really exist as much anymore because you have all these co-ops, you can include them in so many programs and so on and so forth. But anyway, every parent defends their position as to what they chose for the mode of schooling. Certainly, if you put them in public school, there is going to be a spiritual deficiency. There is. What these scholars suggested is, in their studies, Islamic schooling. Okay, now you may agree or disagree, but the fact remains that those seven, eight hours of the day, they are with teachers that are teaching them Islam, obviously also the secular studies as well. They are with students, and they are with like-minded parents that have put them here. Right now, every school has its own flavor, conservative, traditional, some are more liberal, and so on and so forth. So you do what fits your lifestyle, but if your kids do go to public school, then then understand that you will absolutely need to supplement. And the paper in Yakin says that after, after your family environment is channeling them into masjid activities. Al-Falah has to be a center that is bustling with youth-oriented activities. Right, the masjid has to be bustling with youth-oriented activities. Also in public school, what we may categorize as the sins or the bad things are the normative. Understand that drugs, premarital sex, and all of these things is the normative. Not only is it the normative, it is encouraged in public schools. It's encouraged. You get a high five, you get a pat on the back if you participate in those things. In an Islamic school environment, it's clearly the outlier. Now that said, I do want to caveat this point by saying that we do have boyfriend-girlfriend problems in Islamic schools. We do have drug problems in Islamic schools. And if we are asleep at the wheel and don't think that that's happening in Islamic schools, we have to wake up, right? And it goes back to number one, the family environment. We can't think that even if our kid goes to an Islamic school, and this is not by any means a promo for any of the amazing Islamic schools like Nur al-Iman and others that are out there. But even if they go to an Islamic school, you cannot go onto cruise control. You can't go into autopilot mode and say that the school will do everything, right? Because your kid might be with the bad apples. And now that brings me to point number three, the friend circle. The friends that your child chooses. And you have a responsibility in being actively involved in, know, in knowing who their friends are, who their parents are, and if you have some like-mindedness going there. The Prophet ﷺ said, right, that you will be on the deen of your friends. You will be on the deen of your friends. Right, in the self-development genre, they say that you are the average of the five people that you hang around 
the most. And it's true. This is your outside environment, right? And your friends are going to come into play here. I remember there's uh, the Central Jersey community. You know, sometimes Islamic school has become almost a socioeconomic status. My kids go to private school. My kids go to Islamic school. I check off the German car in my driveway, my 3,500 square foot McMansion, and Islamic school. It's part of, you know, it's, it's kind of the par for the course these days to kind of, you know, stay in a gathering. And, you know, even in the Islamic schools, we have to be aware that there was a gathering, and I, and I kind of wince at mentioning this, but I think it, it, it deserves mentioning. The parents were all, you know, uh, associated with an Islamic school. They get together at a gathering, and the azan for Maghrib goes off. The azan for Maghrib goes off, the men make wudu, they line up, and they start praying. Of the about 40 women that were there, all parents of kids that attend Islamic school, about two stood up to pray Maghrib, right? The rest of it, the conversations and so on, just continued. It just continued. And I mention this because sometimes affluence, where we live, and you know where we're at today, sometimes affluence is the cause for our heedlessness. The realm of possibility is very low that all of these women, the other 38 that didn't pray, were all on their monthly cycle. And I don't say this, sisters, my beloved sisters, to put you down in the words of Monty Williams, the coach of the Phoenix Suns, it's not to call you out, it's to call you up, is that if your children are being molded by these parents that other moms, you know, that, is, that the prayer isn't a priority, then we have to think about that. And then, we, and then we as both moms and dads have to do better because our kids are modeling our behavior. The one significant thing in the conclusion section of this paper from Yakin Institute says that in a longitudinal study of over 200 families, the one single thing that ensured the transmission of the parents' religion to the kids was watching their parents' behavior. Of all of the words, all of the evidence, all of the studies, right, there's 75 citations and references and footnotes there. The one thing that it comes back to was if the parents are involved in religious activity and if the parents are actively practicing their religion, right? So it comes back to that. The fourth thing is the masjid, and as I mentioned, the masjid has to be youth oriented. It has to have bustling level of activities for the youth. And um, also, you know, it's worth mentioning that if there's any politics at the masjid, don't pollute your kids' minds with any of that. You don't want any sort of negative associations from the masjid, right, to be with your kids. Make sure that you're involved in the masjid the other thing that I'll mention in terms of Sunday schools, because they're also led by the masajid, and I know we have some of the pioneers here. Um, you know, uh, I see Brother Omar sitting here and Dr. Azhar, your wives that started the Sunday school here and all of the beautiful legacy that that's left, and, and, and Brother Yasser, and so many people that literally built this community with their hands and sweat and blood and tears, and Brother Zahid over here, that one thing that the study found was that a lot of the activities were catered to the younger groups. As they became in their adolescent years, there was a drastic, drastic, significant tapering off of adolescents participating. Why is this important? Because adolescents will take their religion not so much from the parents anymore, but now they start to take it from their peers. And that goes back to the friend circle. All of this is interrelated, right? And so whoever is running the Sunday school today, I used to be involved about 12 years ago when the Sunday schools was run out of the, I think the middle school, um, is to design programs and curriculum for those that are in middle school, you know, your tweens, as well as teenagers, 
and, and make sure that there is a heavy emphasis and focus on that. And then finally, the media that we consume. And this is perhaps the largest problem and issue of our time, is having media available, on demand, ready at our fingertips, right? As I mentioned earlier, you can go down a YouTube rabbit hole and you can be completely out of Islam. You don't want to get a call from Rutgers or your, or your local chaplain at Princeton saying that, you know what, I, I spoke to your son and he thinks he's gay. Or you know what, your daughter is considering leaving Islam. That's akin to getting a door knock on your house from a policeman saying that your son, your daughter was involved in a car accident. Here they lost their life in the dunya, over here we're losing them in the akhirah. Right? What used to happen is that back in my time we had TV and then you had your, you know, your boring programs came on from 5 p.m. onward so we went outside and played. Today the whole landscape has changed. We have on demand. If cable doesn't serve my need, I've got Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, and everything else so I can watch it on demand when I want, what I want. And so, you know, as parents, we have to institute timings that are there. One of the, you know, one of my supervisors that I used to work for when I was in corporate America, Catholic gentleman, nine kids. He said that we never have a screen inside of our kids' rooms. And that, you know, if, even if you do give your child a computer or whatever it is in the room, that the door is always open and the screen is facing outward so the parents can see what's going on. And then there's also software like Circle and Bark that monitors what's happening. If, if, if somebody's being bullied, cyberbullying is a big thing. Every single one of these elements is a chutzpah on its own, by the way. But if, you're, if your child is being bullied, or if there's profane language that's being used in a conversation on Google Hangouts and whatnot, these softwares, they actually pick it up. And so being mindful that we can't just say that, okay, I'm busy, I'm cooking right now, or I have to get this report done, so I'm gonna let the screen babysit my child, right? That's not the right alternative. We have to figure out ways to control that. We have to be cognizant of the amount of time that the kids are spending on screens. And the result of this, the ramifications, ramifications of this, we probably won't know till 10, 20 years from now. Because this is the TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, instant gratification, on the screen, all the time generation. And we won't know 10 to 20 years from now. But what we do know, what we do know works, is controlling that. Not to take it away completely because you still have to fill that vacuum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us a community of believers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our children love the deen, love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, love his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Idu Allah yaqfir lakum dunubakum. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa habibina wa maulana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam kathiman kathiran kathiran kathira wa ba'd. As I wrap up this khutbah, and I apologize for going over by a few minutes, you know, I just want to summarize the five elements that these 12 scholars, that these 31 scholars in this 12 volume book put together is the family environment, the, the uh, schooling, and supplementing that schooling with whatever is lacking, the masjid, and being fully involved as a parent in those religious activities, the friend circle, and then the media, that's being consumed. And after you've done all of that, that's when you put your tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's this movie by, um, with Amir Khan called Dangal, right? Maybe some of you have seen it, where he, during the training period, he throws his daughters, right? The, the daughters, he, he always wanted a son, and long story short, he wants to turn them into wrestlers. They become Olympic wrestling champions for India. And he throws them into a lake and he tells them to swim on their own. Tells them to swim on their own. And he says, you know, Papa Hamesha Neyonge, Apni Jang Khud Se Lerni Padegi. That dad isn't always going to be there for you. You're going to have to fight your own battles. Once you've done the work, once you put the training and you've poured into your kids, you leave the rest.
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to. One of the, you know, uh, it's, it's almost anecdotal, but it's almost, you know, scientific that those that are getting up and praying for their kids in the, in the middle of the night, praying to Hajjah and specifically making dua for the guidance of their children, right? They've seen these kids turn out to be those that continue to practice their deen into the college years. And even if they get derailed, that they have a set of friends that you, by the way, years ago set them up with to guard rail them and keep them on Sarat al Mustaqim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us a community of believers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us a community that is nurturing and fostering our children with a focus on the youth. Allahumma khfir al muslimina wal muslimat wal mu'minina wal mu'minat al ahyai minhum wal amwat inna ka sameen qareeb al muzib al da'wat. Allahumma rabna atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa kina azab al nar wa khilna jannata ma'al abar. Ya azizu ya ghafar ya rab al alameen. رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا حب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة عين واجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم برحمتك يا رحم الرحمين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالأذي والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون وأقيموا الصلاة دائما ابدا لا اله الا الله استو استقيموا وسجدوا straighten the ranks close the gap between you and the person next to you do not like shaitan penetrate the ranks of the believers and pray as if it's your last prayer الله اكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين إذا زلزلت الأرض زلزالها وأخرجت الأرض أثقالها وقال الإنسان ما لها يومئذ تحدث أخبارها بأن ربك أوحى لها يومئذ يسكر الناس والشات ليروا أعمالهم فمن يعمل مثقال ذرة خيرا يراه وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَاهُ الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
Allahu Akbar Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawm Al-Din Iyaka Na'budu Wa Iyaka Nasta'in Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim Sirat Al-Ladhin An'amta Alayhim Ghayri Al-Mardubi Alayhim Allahu Ahad Allahu Samad Lam Yalid Walam Yulad Walam Yakul Lahu Kufu Wan Ahad Allahu Akbar Sami Allahu Liman Hamida Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah